This video was brought to you by my kind supporters on Patreon. Special welcome to my newest patrons, Arwen Du, Generic Pilot, Kilroy McNasty, Matt and Shane McDonough. If you wish to join these folks in supporting me, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash John D. Ruddy. I've nearly reached my goal of 50 patrons, and when that happens, I'll begin producing Patreon-exclusive audio commentaries for each of my Manny Man Does History videos, where I pause the video and point out all sorts of little details of how I made it along the way, and the history too, you know. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon for all of my videos. But without further ado, I am proud to present to you the long-awaited Civil Rights Part 2. Content warning for racial violence. Manny Man Does History Just under a century after the 13th Amendment ended slavery, except as a form of punishment, African Americans continued to struggle against the systemic racism which was baked into the foundations of the country. As progress was made, there was always pushback from white supremacists through barriers to voting, Jim Crow laws, and straight-up violence and murder. While groups like the NAACP were slowly achieving progress through the legal system, the lived experience of many black people on the ground didn't seem to be moving fast enough. The time for protest and direct action was at hand. Groups such as the Regional Council of Negro Leadership had been leading protests against segregation. These groups began to strategize and provide support for black people. In March 1955, 15-year-old Claudette Colvin was arrested after refusing to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. In August, 14-year-old Emmett Till was brutally murdered in Mississippi for allegedly whistling at a white woman. His murderers were acquitted. Emmett's mother insisted on an open casket funeral so people could see his unrecognisable face. Photos of his remains were published in the magazine Jet and brought international attention to the civil rights movement. In December, activist Rosa Parks would go about repeating the bus seat protest of Colvin. Various organisations thought Parks would be a better, more respectable figurehead to rally behind than Colvin, with her more middle-class appearance and lighter skin. Colorism was, and still is, an insidious factor in the lives of people of colour, with whiteness presented as something to aspire to when more negativity is cast towards people of darker skin. Yet another after-effect of white supremacy. For more on this, check out some of these videos by T1J and Khadija Mbo. Links in the description. When Rosa Parks was arrested, leaflets were circulated to begin a boycott of the bus service in Montgomery. The spokesperson for the boycott was Atlanta preacher, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who became known across the country. More bus boycotts sprang up in other cities. The non-violent nature of these protests was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's non-violent struggle for Indian independence from Britain throughout the early 20th century. At the same time, Southern white politicians released the Southern Manifesto, opposing the integration of schools. The next few years would see attempts to integrate schools in the South obstructed by student protest and even state-level intervention. At the beginning of 1957, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed in Atlanta to coordinate non-violent protests against racial discrimination and segregation. In May, 25,000 people descended on Washington, D.C. for the prayer pilgrimage for freedom, where Dr. King gave his Give Us the Ballot speech. In counterpoint to the Christian-led civil rights movement, there was the Nation of Islam, led by Elijah Muhammad. One of his protégés was Malcolm X. The Nation of Islam at the time believed that black people were superior to white people, whom they saw as devils. It wasn't really a call for unity. In September, nine black students in Arkansas were blocked from entering Little Rock Central High School by the National Guard. President Eisenhower would federalize the Arkansas National Guard, taking power from the governor of Arkansas and ensuring the school would be integrated. School integration in the South was like pulling teeth. Eisenhower signed in the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which sought to prosecute those who tried to prevent someone from voting. 
The bill was greatly weakened in the Senate, partially by former Dixiecrat, Senator Strom Thurmond, who conducted the longest speaking filibuster ever by a lone senator, at 24 hours and 18 minutes. While in Delaware, the finance minister of Ghana was refused service in a restaurant. Eisenhower hosted him in the White House a few days later to apologize. Oh, whoops. The end of the 1950s would see various southern state bodies and governors trying to prevent integration while the federal bodies such as the Supreme Court pushed against them. States' rights indeed. In 1960, four black students in Greensboro, North Carolina, sparked a series of non-violent sit-in protests when they were refused service at a white-only Woolworths lunch counter. An Alabama grand jury indicted Martin Luther King for tax evasion because of course they did. In the wake of these non-violent sit-ins, students in Raleigh, North Carolina, formed the Student Non-Violent Coordinating Committee, often known as SNCC. Supporters of these protests faced violence and terrorism. Many of the sit-ins were working, though, with businesses agreeing to integrate. Eisenhower signed in another civil rights bill to penalise those trying to prevent someone from registering to vote. Meanwhile, in Alabama, Dr. King was acquitted of tax evasion. At this time, the Nation of Islam had possibly up to 100,000 members. In October, Dr. King, along with 50 others, were arrested during a sit-in in Atlanta. King was sent to prison, but was freed after Northern Democrat Robert F. Kennedy intervened. In New Orleans, Ruby Bridges became the first African-American child to attend an all-white elementary school in the South. In December... The Supreme Court managed to outlaw segregation on interstate buses and, in turn, their bus terminals. With this in mind, the Congress of Racial Equality organised groups of people to ride the buses, testing the new laws. The Freedom Riders were met with fierce violence and incarceration throughout the South, but that didn't stop the movement from growing. Dr King joined the Freedom Riders and a congregation of 1,500 people in Montgomery. They came under siege by an angry mob and Robert Kennedy, now Attorney General, sent federal marshals to protect the civil rights activists. He then petitioned the Interstate Commerce Commission to enforce desegregation of interstate travel. Throughout the summer, the US Department of Justice began talks with civil rights groups to establish the Voter Education Project. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference began citizenship classes to help black people register to vote. Once again, they were met with fierce white supremacist violence and murder. After months of pressure from the Freedom Riders and Robert F. Kennedy, all interstate buses needed a certificate saying, Seating aboard this vehicle is without regard to race, colour, creed or national origin, by order of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Freedom Riders continued to test these rules, making sure they became a reality. Some were arrested in Albany, Georgia. Dr. King arrived amidst the hullabaloo and he too was arrested, yet again. King's trial was ultimately postponed and he left town. 1962 saw more protests and more backlash. The FBI monitored and wiretapped many involved in the movement. In Los Angeles, after the LAPD raided a mosque, Malcolm X wanted to enact violent revenge against them, but lacked the support from Elijah Muhammad. In Sasser, Georgia, that September, two black churches, which were being used for voter registration meetings, were burned down. James Meredith attempted to enroll in the University of Mississippi, being the first black student there, but he was barred. The Supreme Court once again intervened, Meredith was enrolled, and white people rioted, killing two people. That November, President Kennedy signed in an executive order to ban segregation in federally funded housing. At the beginning of 1963, new governor of Alabama, George Wallace, infamously called for segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Throughout April and May, civil rights groups held daily mass demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. In Gadsden, Alabama, Mary Hamilton was jailed for contempt of court when she refused to answer to her first name. In courts at the time, white women were addressed as Miss, Black people simply by their first names. Hamilton wanted the same courtesy extended to her and all people of colour. Later, the Supreme Court would agree. 
Several movement leaders in Birmingham were arrested, including, once again, Martin Luther King, who, while in jail, wrote a letter to the people saying how they have a moral responsibility to break unjust laws, to act now rather than waiting for the courts, which may take forever. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The Birmingham Children's Crusade saw over a thousand children and students on a youth march arrested. Protesters were met with fire hoses and police dogs. Dr. King and the thousands of jailed demonstrators were released, helped by singer and activist Harry Belafonte and Robert F. Kennedy. With all this coming to a head, a truce was negotiated and businesses agreed to roll back segregation laws and the long month of mass demonstrations in Birmingham came to an end. Just in time for the Ku Klux Klan to let off two bombs and spark a massive riot across the city. In June, as Vivian Malone and James Hood attempted to enter the University of Alabama, Governor George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door in protest. Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach asked him to step aside, but he wouldn't budge. It took National Guard Brigadier General Henry Graham with a presidential order to remove Governor Wallace. That same day, President John F. Kennedy promised a civil rights bill for the next week, asking for the kind of equality of treatment we would want for ourselves. The following day, Medgar Evers, Field Secretary of the NAACP, was assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi. That summer, 80,000 black people registered to vote in Mississippi to show their desire to participate in the political system. On the 28th of August 1963, 250,000 people, mostly African American, took part in the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, organised by the Big Six, John Lewis, Whitney Young, A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, James Farmer and Roy Wilkins. Dr. King, upon the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, gave his immortal speech, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In September, schools in Birmingham were integrated by National Guardsmen. Five days later, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed by the Ku Klux Klan, killing four young girls. In response to this, James Bevel and Diane Nash began the Alabama Voting Rights Project. That November, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. He was succeeded by his vice president, Texas Democrat Lyndon B. Johnson. In January 1964, the 24th Amendment abolished poll taxes for federal elections. Another roadblock to voting was removed. In Mississippi, freedom libraries were opened and run by volunteers, helping improve African American literacy. That summer, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was founded to challenge the all-white representatives at the Democratic National Convention. In Tuscaloosa, Alabama, police tear-gassed, beat and arrested peaceful protesters beginning a march to the county courthouse. In Philadelphia, Mississippi, three civil rights workers were murdered and buried. Malcolm X had become disillusioned with the Nation of Islam and so went his own way, meeting other civil rights leaders and travelling to Mecca and across Africa and Europe. He founded the Organisation of Afro-American Unity to promote links with Africa. On the 2nd of July, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned discrimination based on race, colour, religion, sex or national origin in employment or public accommodations. And so racism ended. Not really. With such support for civil rights coming from a Southern Democrat president... Many whites in the South turned against the Democratic Party and began to support the Republican Party. This is where the parties flipped in many of their political positions, and the South soon became a Republican stronghold, not Democrat. President Johnson famously said himself, We have lost the South for a generation. For more on the political party flip, check out this video from Knowing Better. Link in the description. In December, Dr. King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, becoming the youngest person to receive it at the time. 
The civil rights movement saw so many peaceful protests violently broken up and people being hurt or indeed killed. In February 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated by members of the Nation of Islam while in New York. That march in Alabama, following the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a march of around 600 people organised by the Selma Voting Rights Movement, began in Selma and planned to march to the state capital in Montgomery. When they went to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, state troopers were there to block them and brutally attack them. Two days later, clergy from all across the country joined the protest and attempted to cross the bridge again, but Dr. King called them back. That evening, Boston Minister Reverend James Reeb was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan in Selma. Days later, President Johnson urged Congress to pass the Voting Rights Bill, using the protest phrase, We shall overcome. The marchers in Selma successfully crossed the bridge and began the five-day journey to Montgomery. Dr. King delivered a speech on the steps of the state capitol, How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Hours later, activist Viola Liuzzo was shot dead by another KKK terrorist. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was established, and the following month, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prevented literacy tests as a voting requirement, and federal bodies could oversee election procedure. Progress was being made, but there was still far to go. That August, riots broke out in LA over frustration with police brutality. At least 34 people were killed, over 1,000 injured, and over 3,000 arrested. It was very destructive. In early 1966, Vernon Dahmer of the NAACP died from a bomb in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Later in June, James Meredith was shot in Memphis, Tennessee, as he began his march against fear. Many civil rights leaders rallied together to complete his march, gaining 25,000 marchers. Upon its completion, Stokely Carmichael first used the phrase black power as a political slogan in his speech. At this time, the civil rights movement began to concentrate on fighting poverty and not just in the Deep South. That summer, Dr. King, James Bevel, Al Rabbi and others led the Chicago Open Housing Movement to make changes there. In October 1966, the Black Panther Party, a socialist movement, was founded in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, seeking to protect their community, setting up community programs and cop watching, carrying firearms in public and looking out for police brutality. The following year, the state of California got rid of open carry laws, funnily enough. At this same time, the USA was well and truly involved in the war in Vietnam, with thousands of troops being drafted all the time. In April 1967, Dr. King spoke out against the war and indeed against capitalism, saying, When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, The giant triplets of racism, materialism and militarism are incapable of being conquered. This lost him a lot of support from the establishment, including President Johnson. In June, the Supreme Court ruled that blocking interracial marriages was unconstitutional. Throughout the long, hot summer of 1967, communities across America burned with riots. The pot beyond the Deep South had well and truly been stirred. Despite the progress being made in the legal system, things were nowhere near fixed in a country with deep, deep wounds yet to scar over. Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American justice of the US Supreme Court, which was exciting. In 1968, in Orangeburg, South Carolina, highway patrol officers opened fire on protesters on a university campus, killing three people. After two African-American sanitation workers were killed in a trash compactor in Memphis, Tennessee, while on duty, other sanitation workers went on strike, demanding better conditions and more pay. Dr. King came to Memphis in support of the strike and delivered his mountaintop speech, saying... Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, 
But it really doesn't matter with but me But it really now. doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The next day, April 4th, 1968, despite his non-violent stance, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on the balcony of the motel he was staying in. Riots broke out in more than 150 cities across America in response to Dr. King's murder. The African-American community, and indeed the world, had lost a great leader. President Johnson declared a national day of mourning. James Earl Ray would later be convicted for Dr. King's murder. Days later, President Johnson signed the Fair Housing Acts to ban discrimination in selling, renting and financing houses, and it also tightened laws around rioting. Thankfully, the cause did not die with Dr. King. In May, the Poor People's Campaign marched on Washington, furthering the vision for economic justice. In June, civil rights ally Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated while running for president. Later that year, during the Mexico City Olympics, athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists in the Black Power salute during their medal ceremony. It truly was an inspirational movement, which sparked many other movements, including women's liberation, gay liberation, and even the Catholic civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. It also inspired shows like Sesame Street to work towards a brighter, more integrated future. As much progress as the civil rights movement gained, as history has shown, constant vigilance is needed. As progress has slid backwards time and time again, the establishment would continue to criminalise strong black leaders. More policies ensured the pipeline of black bodies to prison. The so-called war on drugs started by President Nixon and kicked into overdrive by President Reagan saw a massive increase in the incarceration of black men. The Southern strategy was a very insidious method to distance conservatism from the overt racism of the likes of George Wallace. It changed the narrative from Negroes to thugs and made race a subtext rather than text. Black people would strike out against injustice and the now fully militarised police force would come down hard on them and allowed the image of dangerous, unruly black people to be perpetuated as the dominant image. President Clinton's three strikes and you're out policy saw even more black men thrown into prison. And as we learned about the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, it doesn't count for those being punished. The election of Barack Obama saw the first African American becoming president. This allowed many people to relax and believe that racism was over. It's never over. Racism is something our brain does to try and make sense of the world super quickly. It's about being aware of when our mind makes these assumptions and whether they're based on facts or what we've been conditioned to believe. The Black Lives Matter movement arose from a continuing pattern of injustice and black people being killed by police. Today, the United States has the highest percentage of people in prison in the world. The fact that many prisons are private businesses actually creates a demand for prisoners. Go capitalism. When we look at American history, it's amazing to see how much has changed, but also 
how much has stayed the same. The South complained about the interfering federal government from the days of Thomas Jefferson. When the enslaved people gained their freedom, many in the establishment did their best to move the goalposts to stop certain people from voting. As progress was made, the goalposts changed. In 2013, the Supreme Court ruled parts of the 1965 Voting Rights Act were unconstitutional, allowing for states once again to make up their own election laws without federal oversight. The goalposts continue to be changed. It's almost as if there are those in the land of the free who want less people to vote. Donald Trump's presidency helped in rolling back many of the civil rights gains as many white supremacists regained the confidence to come back out into the open. Racism has not gone anywhere. Something is rotten in the States of America and indeed beyond. At least the 1964 Civil Rights Act was the gift that keeps on giving, clarifying rights for LGBTQ plus people in 2020. But these are just the facts of history, coming from a white guy in Ireland. Go and listen to people of colour. Listen to their stories, their diverse perspectives, their experiences. Okay. I'm done here now. Special thanks to Dr. Eben Joseph and Abby Ikenezer for helping me with this project. Thanks for watching, folks. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified as soon as my new videos come out. The dreaded algorithm has been pretty tough these days, so hitting the bell icon really helps. What helps even more is supporting me on Patreon. You can support the creation of these videos on Patreon and enjoy a load of benefits. You can buy my books and all sorts of Manny Man merchandise at johndruddy.com, including this detailed poster of the Presidents of the United States. You can also follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitch, and Twitter, and TikTok, and all sorts of those places for pictures and stuff. It's fun. And you can also check out my Star Trek podcast, where many have gone before, which is on Spotify and Apple Music, where I watch Star Trek for the very first time. Welcome to our new supporters, Arwen Du, Generic Pilot, Kilroy McNasty, Matt and Shane McDonough. Thanks to all my patrons, Alexander, Arthur Revan, Brendan J. Cassidy, Brian Hembling, Chair DJ, Colton Sayre, David Stranad, Emer Gibson, Senan Age 10, Frank Porter, Gretchen Sand, Helena Orby, Jefferson Yates, Joshua Benjamin Heisler, Judy Friesen, Cafort, Catherine Gilks, Kythias, Lapre Shea Queen Vara, Marcus Booker, Matt, Mike Wise, Mundi Rico, Mr. Magnificent, Mr. Research, Classy Black Man, Mr. Easy Play 2, Mycroft, Myth Gwyn, Ollie Coors, Patrick McGrath, Rocket Wrench, Ryan Alano, Serena Kajani, SB, Suarez, Stephanie Lentz, Talitha Brower, Tanmay, Thomas Woods, Travis Dunn. Once again, thank you.